It's time to get started So take a seat It's the Science Cafe Brought to you by OE Hi everyone! Can everyone hear okay? You want to try yours with me? Can everybody hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for coming to our, um, let's see, this is our second cafe for the spring semester. Um, I have a kind of a big load of announcements in the beginning here, and then we'll get on to our talk for this evening. Um, first, uh, this is Science Cafe, in case you, uh, this is your first time to an event. Um, we are a group of graduate students in the life sciences at UMass. And um, we uh, started this organization in 2011 to start bringing uh, the current research that's going on at UMass to uh, out into the community and kind of get the public engaged and uh, kind of keep up with what's going on just down the street. Um, so just so everybody knows kind of the format of the cafe tonight, we're going to have kind of three vignettes where we... Um, uh, Hannah and I will talk up here for a few minutes and kind of go through some topics and then we'll open it up for a few minutes of audience questions um, that you guys can participate. So you'll have three options or three opportunities for asking questions uh, throughout the cafe tonight. And then uh, absolutely everyone is more than welcome to and encouraged to stay afterwards and we can continue the conversation here um, with our speaker and you know as, as we all can hang out afterwards. Uh, there are going to be uh, photos and videos taken tonight, uh, so if you would like to not have your photo taken or be on video, please let our uh, cameraman know, because uh, these will be posted online. Uh, we would like to thank our funding sources, which are listed here on the screen, and I would like to let everyone know about our end of year celebration that we have uh, at the end of May, where we bring back all the previous speakers from the academic year from all of our cafes. Um, and it's called Science After Dark. And uh, it's self-funded, so please consider donating to the uh, graduated cylinder in the back. It will be just kind of a celebration after our last cafe where we can all hang out and have some drinks and food and, um, and usually some, some art as well. Uh, our next cafe is on Thursday, April 11th. Um, we're gonna be talking with uh, Dr. Jennifer Albertine on the science of allergies will be very timely. Uh, and lastly, I would like to now introduce our speaker for tonight. And uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that we were planning to have two speakers with us tonight, but unfortunately, Dr. Uh, Pascarella had some car issues coming uh, from Boston and she wasn't able to get her car looked at time. So unfortunately, um, we're missing Dr. Pascarella, but fortunately, we do have our wonderful Dr. Hannah Broadley here. Uh, so Hannah finished her uh, PhD recently here at UMass, so she is an alumna from uh, the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology program, which many of us are also currently involved with. Um, she is now a postdoc uh, working for, in conjunction with UMass and USDA. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and get started. And thank you so much for making the trip out here. We are so excited to have you. It's great to be back. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, would you like to give us more of an introduction of kind of who you are and your past and what you're doing now, and especially with your new job at USDA? Yeah, definitely. So as, uh, as you said, I'm recently uh, graduated from here, um, although recently is starting, time starting to pass. I was just talking about this, like gosh, it's kind of starting to almost be a year. Anyway, I finished in August. Uh, so I finished in August. I was in Joe Elkington's lab, who's sitting right here. So if we get into gypsy moth things, which Val was gonna cover, we might defer some of the uh, questions over here. Um, I was at Joe Elkington's lab uh, working on forest insects. There's uh, forest insect ecology um, and particularly invasive insects. Um, and then finished with that, my primary project there was with winter moth, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And now um, I'm doing a postdoc with a USDA lab out on Cape Cod and I'm working on biocontrol of a couple of different species, but primarily working on spotted lanternfly now, which we also will get into, um, as, yeah, as well as a couple of others. Awesome, great. Uh, well, thank you for giving us a little bit more details on where you're at. 
Um, so I figured with the, with the talk tonight, we can start as, as broadly as we can. So I guess what I'm um, interested in to start is kind of what do you and maybe your field, how exactly do you de define an invasive species? And maybe can you use a couple of examples that maybe some folks in the audience might um, kind of relate to or something that we might have seen in our backyards? I'm going to start with there's not a good definition. <laughs> And that's like more and more, I feel like, debated as well. So I'm just going to start with that. Mm -hmm. But in general, an invasive species is a species not from, that's not endemic to this area. So it didn't evolve in this particular area and has been moved into the area as a non native and then has become a pest. So you can have non native species that are not a pest, but once they start to cause problems for the ecosystem or for people, then they're usually classified as invasives um, when they're just outbreaking and spreading all over the place. But there's a lot of wiggle room mm -hmm. in there. <laughs> yeah. So is there a particular um, example that's kind of one of the most uh, maybe iconic uh, invasive species that uh, might especially be prevalent here in Massachusetts? So, kind of like, where, where did it come from? How did it get here? Why is it an issue? Yeah, definitely. So we could start with either, because we have some few good visuals with these. Pulling up. So not necessarily, so these are even broader. So we're not necessarily getting right into Massachusetts, but these are just some that I think are iconic and just pretty stunning. So this is kudzu. Um, all of that is kudzu. Mm -hmm. All of that over everything there is kudzu, which I just find this a sort of an interesting one because it, it grows very fast. Um, it just coats everything. And this one I think is a nice example because actually I think most of the examples I'm going to give are ones that were brought in on purpose. Um, so we have invasive species that were brought in, you arrived accidentally. Like they came in on shipping and whatnot, like most of our stuff comes in accidentally. This was brought in for um, uh, erosion, stabilizing for erosion and also as fodder um, and got out of hand. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so this one I also really like, particularly because, so we debated whether we should add this other picture of people in boats because they look quite angry, but he put it in anyways. <laughs> So this is Asian carp, which is this whole, there's a bunch of different species that are sort of classified as Asian carp. But um, in general, this group of uh, fish that uh, were used in uh, fisheries to help clean up um, sort of algae and growth and like um, just sort of keep the, the agriculture a little bit cleaner. They got out, there was a flood and then they escaped and then have been moving up the Mississippi and are maybe now um, in the Great Lakes. I know there was a lot of concern a couple of years about of them getting into the Great Lakes. So somebody in the audience may know if they are. But I think they're pretty striking because there's been a lot of accidents. A lot of people have gotten injured because when they um, get scared, the Asian carp uh, flick themselves out of the water. And so when a motorboat goes by, um, they'll flick themselves out of the water and slap people in the face and there's been <laughs> broken bones and scrapes and injuries. There's been a lot of people that have gone to the hospital because of these, wow. which is sort of one of your things we want to talk about, like human health yeah. issues. <laughs> this is one. <laughs> that like so that guy yeah. is there like just trying to protect himself from it. <laughs> yeah. And then I think the other one that I thought was a very iconic one is domestic cats. And uh, I- Controversial. <laughs> it is. I love domestic cats. I came in and like the first thing I did was like then roll my pants because I have my cat's hair all over me. But this, these are a really big one. These are the main uh, source of mortality for uh, birds in the United States. And hugely over, I think it's listed as the second highest mortality is from collision with uh, uh, windows and uh, cars. But the uh, mortality from cats is way is like four times as much as any other mortality source. And it is a controversial one. Yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but you can still have cats and keep them inside, yeah. which is what I do. Yeah. <laughs> 
So it seems like we have a lot of players, uh, some of these examples from all sorts of places all over the world, and you were saying some are intentionally brought, some come accidentally to a new place. Um, so are all um, non-native organisms and in considered invasive, or are there kind of, you know, they bring it, they come in and they're, they're not native, but uh, how, how does it, um, what makes an organism an invasive non-native um, when it gets to that new place? And are there any that aren't invasive? So there's ones that people sort of in general consider not invasive. Again, it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. Like, it's what is sort of the threshold of harm and who, what other species is it harming and do we even know what it's doing? Mm -hmm. And does that really matter? Maybe that's just how things evolve. Things change. They're changing really fast due to human mm -hmm. um, sources of change. So, but anyways, it's... There's not, again, there's not a great definition, but there are definitely non-natives um, that are not considered invasive. And uh, we were talking, some of these were, I had this sort of vague sense, I'll pull it up, this vague sense of like, I remember when I was learning about wildflowers that like my book that I would go through, um, I would look up and it always listed whether they were native or not native. And I remember just sort of having this feeling of so many species were listed as non-native. And we were talking about this the other day. It was like, what are these species? Let's go back and look at some examples. I think, is it the next slide? So apparently dandelions are not native. I, this blew me away. You guys are nodding. So apparently other people knew this. I did, we were both like, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so dandelions were brought in in the 1600s. Yeah, you're not, yeah. as as food for dandelion wine and for medicinal use were brought in with early colonialization and back in, it's like, they're dating it to like 1620, but early 1600s. I did not know that. Um, and then Queen Anne's Lace was another one. That one I kind of did know. And then Wood Sorrel, I put that one up because I didn't know that either. And I remember, like I just, as a kid, how it, Wood Sorrel, like you can eat the leaves and it has a nice sort of like lemony taste. Mm -hmm. And I, that I did that a lot as a kid, um, just going out and eating wood sorrel. I had no idea if that wasn't native either. So those were some examples that yeah, I, that, that's when I dug into it a little bit. The D and the lines. Yeah. Was like, <laughs> that, that surprised me. It's sort of, um, so earthworms are another one that I, when I learned that earthworms were not native, that just blew my mind too. Wow. Did you know that? I did not know that. <laughs> wow. Well, or most of the earthworms that we have. There were yeah. apparently some native earthworms, but they've been pretty much all um, wow. outcompeted. Wow, so it seems like we rely on, I mean, you know, earthworms, we rely on earthworms for all their, you know, all their ecosystem services. So it seems right. like that's a good thing. <laughs> right, and, and I, I guess that so was part of what I was surprised with dandelions. There, I mean, a lot of people are fighting dandelions as weeds in their yards. Mm -hmm. And there's so much herbicide dumped into people's yards and so much effort that people go into. But also, like, uh, for pollinators, mm -hmm. I often hear or sort of people encouraging not to, to cut your dandelions because they're really early flower that's available yeah. there for pollinators that's when there yeah. may not be other flowers. So I've yeah. sort of thought of them as a you know a good thing, yeah. Yeah. and huh. they're yeah. not so native apparently. This, yeah. yeah, interesting continuum of super damaging invasives taking over to kind of oh well you know we'll let it we're gonna let it be there and. Well, bring it in. Or, uh, yeah, I guess you were saying they were brought in intentionally, so for so dandelion wine and medicinal use. Yeah, yeah. which is exactly why it's like the perspective of what is invasive versus mm -hmm. just non-native. Yeah, is yeah. confusing. Is yeah, very human-centric. I mm -hmm. guess in terms of what are <coughs> what we want to get out of the ecosystem. Right. Maybe. It all depends on your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess this is a good opportunity for us to open up for audience questions now that we've kind of had a good intro and then we can, yeah, go ahead. It's Teresa. not so much a question as a comment because oh, we were just talking good. about um, not natives that are not invasive. Mm -hmm. Earthworms are considered invasive in our forests because oh. they mm -hmm. um, can decompose the leaf litter because they haven't developed in our forests. Mm -hmm. um, that leaf litter is really important 
Mm -hmm. So while they're really good for our crops Maybe agricultural. in our worlds and our mm -hmm. agricultural, they are, by a lot of people, scientists now consider invasive if they enter forest systems. Yeah. I did not know that. So, so, <laughs> so they're degrading it too fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. And they were killed off by the glaciers. Mm -hmm. So the places that had glaciers kind of killed off our native earthworms, and then the forest systems developed afterwards without them. Again, so that's another example. It depends on your perspective, right? Yeah. Because if you're a gardener, you're you want them. Mm -hmm. If you're, yeah, I don't know what in the but forest you don't want them. Yeah. People who have composting mm -hmm. um, things with those uh, red crawlers and stuff like that, yeah. they're trying to more awareness of don't let it out into the backyard if you don't want the worms anymore, because mm -hmm. it could create more problems in your backyard than. Yeah. So is that in? Sorry. We could Another question. Well, question for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's interesting. Is that um, just in the Northeast, or is this kind of yeah. all over the U.S.? Or okay. in the Northeast and West, I think you know anywhere where the glaciers spread is where mm -hmm. they're not gotcha. performing. Yeah. So I think down in some of the more southern regions, earthworms are still considered native. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. They don't cause problems. Well, thank you for that Sorry. comment. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was very interesting. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> It seems that whether, whether we call it invasive or not really depends on whether we find it useful. But how much data is it there? Another good example of how the size of the earth world is a honeybee. Yeah, uh, that's a know, great example. Everybody you know, loves the honeybee these days, there's honey. Um, the American Indians uh, uh, used to uh, be able to chart whether Europeans were in the area by whether they saw their honeybees or not. If you saw a honeybee, it meant the Europeans saw it. Again. And of course, what they've done is <coughs> come compete and, and yes. uh, uh, eliminate a lot of the native species also. So cool. it really depends on, um, you have to look at what's, what it's doing to the ecosystem, like earthworms, rather than what it's doing for us. Definitely. Really Definitely, yeah, that's another really agree. Mm -hmm. It really totally depends on your perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, like you were saying, a lot of things for agriculture might be beneficial for all of our agricultural ecosystems, but once they kind of seep out into the into the natural ecosystem, it it really throws everything for a loop. Yeah. I'm a fisherman and an outdoorsman, and yeah. most of the species that they stock mm -hmm. are invasive, well not non-invasive, non-local mm -hmm. species, like mm -hmm. they stock ring-neck pheasants from China or whatever for hundreds of years, they're not from around here, mm -hmm. but and they don't reproduce, I guess, or whatever. The same thing with the fish, most of the fish that they stock are raised to grow big fast so, and to mm -hmm. be healthy against diseases, so they can dump a lot in and have people catch a lot of fish, mm -hmm. but they're not the native little brook trout that used to be around here, so mm -hmm. you'd think that they would want to try to make the, the species succeed that were here before, but they seem to actually work against that constantly mm -hmm. because of what they say people want. Mm -hmm. The sportsmen want other species or bigger fish or whatever it is. The flashier, bigger really, things. Nobody stuff. really asks. That's just all <laughs> sort of in the policies. Yeah. I feel like that's something, um, yeah, at some point we'll talk about like what can people do about this. I think in general it's to be inquisitive like that and actually ask like why do we do it like this? Do we want to keep on doing it like this? Is there another way we could do this? I think that's sort of the sort of education and curiosity is kind of the most important thing that people can do. I know we're kind of getting to that towards yeah. the end, but yeah. Especially like um, everything is going to sort of is relative, especially with climate change and how species are going to be moving to different areas and conservation efforts. We can kind of save that toward the end, but I think you bring up a really that sort of brings up a really good point. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's go ahead and get on to our next uh, little section here where we can kind of go into. Um, some of your personal research and mm -hmm. kind of what we do to study and especially respond to really um, damaging, in our perspective, <laughs> damaging uh, invasive species. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I guess we could start off with how do you study this? Mm -hmm. um, how do you study some of these populations or some of these species? Um, and how has that led to kind of how, how we respond? Mm -hmm. 
Well, a good place for me to start is my dissertation work. Because as I said, I can just go on and on and on and on and on about that. So I worked on a winter moth for, for that work. A winter moth is a defoliating caterpillar, um, mostly out in the eastern Massachusetts area is where it's a problem. Um, luckily, it hasn't made it uh, this far west. Um, it's here in Massachusetts. This is actually the third and fourth um, fourth introduction of winter moth to North America. It's native to Europe. Um, and sort of how, so how do you start studying these things? So winter moth um, came in probably uh, in the 1990s, um, but didn't start outbreaking until the early 2000s. So a smaller population and it just sort of quietly was reproducing for a number of years before people started like, what? is this like this is this is odd this is you know there's a lot of these and it's not quite following the same life history as our native species um and so people were starting to report that like there's something this is different what's going on and uh reporting that to different extension uh officers or um state officials and then it's sort of sort of pass, gets passed around and that, so I, as I said, I'm, I was working with Joe Elkington, they, they started working on this um, early 2000s of like this, you know, this is odd, we need to figure out what this is. And so kind of one of the first steps there is, well, one, studying the life history. What is this? Is, you know, is this just a weird climate thing that like a native species is acting different? Um, so we do have a very closely related native species called Bruce Spanworm. Um, and so kind of another step is to start doing genetics to figure out what, what is this exactly? Is it our native species? If it's not, where did it come from? And sort of tracking back in the genetics. So that's definitely a tool that's used a lot for invasive species to start to understand what each population is and where it came from. And then um, if Val was here today, she would talk a little bit about aerial surveys. So as these different species, so primarily talking about forest pests here, um, for forest species, as they start to outbreak, you can see the loss of foliage or the damage to the trees. Um, and historically, that was surveys using um, either just going out and surveying on the ground or um, doing aerial surveys, doing flyovers and mapping out where damaged trees were, where defoliation is. Um, there's a lot of work now doing um, remote sensing, so doing GIS for mapping out damage. So Val would have shown some really cool, well we can still get to them at some point, but does she uh, looks for signals for using satellites for change in defoliation over time to map out where um, insect populations are and how those have changed and expanded over time. We can show it if you, if you wanted to. Yeah, we can pull up. Val has some pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I think it's way at the end, yeah? We can, of our, we can backtrack some. So doing aerial surveys um, was sort of historically, and then so Val's using uh, satellites, using Landsat satellite, um, which has really high resolution images. And then, so here's some uh, images that Val um, made, some of products she made for looking at gypsy moth in uh, 2016 and 2017. So the red there is where heavy defoliation, areas with heavy defoliation. So she was looking at a signal of where um, green, where the trees greened up and then lost that green. Um, so they greened up and then gypsy moth uh, went in, which is another defoliating caterpillar, would eat those leaves and then you lose that. Um, and so Val was looking for that signal of seeing green and then losing it. And then she plotted out in 2016 and then in 2017, how it moved away from that hot spot there to kind of into the surrounding areas. Um, so gypsy moth, is an invasive species that has been here since the late 1800s um, and has gone through different cycles of uh, uh, outbreaks and under control and outbreaks and unfortunately we are now seeing uh, really heavy densities of gypsy moth now. Um, that was another one that was brought in purposely um, but it escaped. So it was brought in as sort of uh, 
to see if it could uh, produce silk using native species, like using native uh, host plants, mm -hmm. if it could produce silk, and it uh, escaped out of the Medford area. And uh, the story goes that Truvalo, the guy that was working on this, really tried to get support to, like, you know, these escaped, like, we need to take care of this now, like, this is a problem. I've heard the story both ways, like, one, that he didn't really try to do anything, and two, he escaped. He definitely did. He definitely tried, right? Yeah. But it, they were just like, oh, it's fine, it's well, fine, it's fine, no problem. No. And then it really was not fine. <laughs> Um, and then since it has spread most of the way across the country, and we're still de yeah. dealing with the consequences. One other thing with valves, yeah. that's, that's such a powerful tool with this, is that yeah. Val is actually creating these in real time. So yeah. she's like, weekly, she can actually upgrade the map. And, and you can look at it, you're, you're looking at three states that she's doing, bingo, yeah. <laughs> you know, almost instantly. She's trained the computer now to pick out individual trees and compare them to last week. That's and pretty amazing. And use the, sort of the same techniques and algorithm for different species. Um, so you're showing gypsy moth here, but you can do this for winter moth and very, very high resolution. So it's a pretty cool advance in detection and monitoring of where species, um, yeah. like forest species are and what's happening That's with them. Yeah, do you um, mind actually going back a couple slides so we can really look at that? Um, kind of image of the defoliation, I'm, just to make sure. I'm sure everyone has seen this. I feel like this is a very like, iconic photo, but the, the photo on the right, where it's just a photo of the, the tree line, kind of, you can see this huge patch of just brown in the middle. And I, I don't know, I think that's a really powerful image, too, to see that. Yeah, I would, I've been pretty amazed seeing the gypsy moth damage. Um, I mean, I guess the last outbreak was mid 1980s. Okay, early 1980s. You know, like lots of people had talked about experiencing that. I did not experience it. I was not alive. Um, so, but it's been. I mean, this is the interesting thing about being in my situation. I was like, this is so cool. It's like, oh no, actually, this is really bad. But, which I did. I was in the field this last week, and I was like, oh my gosh, look at this infestation of of spotted lantern fire. Like, oh, this is not good. This is bad. But so it was, it's been really interesting for me driving out on, you know, driving out on um, 90 towards Boston which just on either side is just complete defoliation of the oak trees there. And you know, you could just, somebody just plopped you right there and asked you what season it is, is it? You know, you would say January, February. Like it looks like the leaves weren't, hadn't even been there yet. Complete defoliation. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty that's, shocking. Yeah, that is pretty, pretty shocking. So, um, yeah, now that we've kind of seen some of the larger scale methods um, that scientists are using now to monitor and kind of track these populations, uh, do you want to give us um, some information about how uh, you and your lab has been using biocontrol and kind of what is it, um, how does it work, and what kind of you know, information do you, do you get before implementing a biocontrol agent? Yeah, so uh, we worked on in Joe's lab, and then what I'm continuing to work on is biological control. So this is using our knowledge about the ecology of the system kind of to our advantage. Um, so it's in sort of in general looking at predators, parasites, and pathogens, and how these kill uh, different species. Um, invasive, it's sort of a term used for, well, Mostly invasive species, also native pest species, but it's pretty much um, pretty much just an invasive species. And it's the idea, so classical biocontrol or importation biocontrol is the idea of um, we have these different species. So I'll go back to winter moth uh, as a good example. So for my dissertation work, winter moth is from Europe. It was accidentally introduced here. Has been a problem in eastern Massachusetts, especially on. Um, apples, maples, um, big problem on cranberry and blueberry as well. Um, wanted to know, so what, you know, what kills this in Europe? Why is this not a problem in Europe? What's different about the, the ecosystem with winter moth here in Massachusetts as compared to Europe? 
So winter moth actually was already, there was already biological control programs used for winter moth in Canada, in both Nova Scotia and British Columbia that were um, implemented successfully. So they kind of did the initial round of testing and then um, it, we got to implement it here in Massachusetts as well. And so it's kind of a scary idea for a lot of people um, in that for classical biocontrol, you're bringing in another species to help control the species that's a problem here. Um, but when it's done properly, which it's now since the 1970s, there's been a lot of regulation on how to, what has to go through, a lot of federal regulation of how this works. So um, prior to that, not, there was a lot of biocontrol gone wrong, but now <laughs> regulations are really strict. And it really makes sense because you're going back and looking at these systems um, back in the native range and looking at these co-evolved species that have struck this balance over thousands and thousands of over millennia, um, that they're, they're always sort of fighting for this arms race, like one sort of trying to figure out how to reproduce faster and the other co-evolved species is trying to sort of overcome those defenses. And so they evolve really closely. And then when you separate these things, so you, when you separate this um, species from these natural enemies that kill it in the native range, it can suddenly outbreak. So for winter moth, um, we were working with a parasitoid, so that's just a parasite of an insect, that term parasitoid. So we were working with this parasite that's actually this uh, parasitic fly um, that they co-evolved. So this fly cannot live without winter moth, um, so it can't use other species to reproduce, not even our native species, not even Bruce Spamworm. So not even the most closely related thing here, not even the species that winter moth can hybridize with. It can only complete its life cycle with winter moth. So you can bring this species in, introduce it as well, and then it kind of goes around and does all the work for us. So instead of pouring pesticides over everything, instead of mechanically chipping things, that this species just, it goes around and finds the, the winter moth, lays its eggs. Um, the winter moth um, inadvertently eats those eggs. So the, the fly lays the eggs on the leaves. Winter moth then eats those eggs as it's just feeding on the foliage. The egg sits up in the salivary gland. Um, and then when winter moth uh, finishes feeding, it drops to the ground. We can pull, we can go back. I can help walk through this as I'm, okay. So we have uh, winter moth feeding in the spring. Um, it then, when it completes its feeding, winter moth drops to the ground. Um, and at that point, this parasitic fly um, can start, uh, hatches out as a maggot and starts eating the winter moth from the inside out. Um, and then you end up with a little fly pupa in there instead of a winter moth. And then um, when most of the other winter moth then, they come out in November and December, um, thus the name winter moth. So the moths come out, if they've been parasitized, they don't come out. That fly just stays put in the ground over winters and then in the spring that new, new round of fly comes out. Um, so these guys can just go around and find all the winter moth and you know, do that, sort of do that work for us to kind of reach that balance that has co-evolved in Europe. Oh, that's, yeah, that sounds very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen Alien, but that's when we talk about parasitic <laughs> insects. That's what a lot of people refer yeah. to. I need to go and see that because that's yeah. like a very common of the alien eating the its host from the inside bursting out and out. Then bursting out. Yeah. That's what these parasitic insects oh, do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I'm sure I, mean, I have a lot of questions to follow up with that. But yeah. we'll go ahead and open it up to the audience and uh, see what questions we have and then move on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just curious about the defoliation part of it. How can you uh, tell whether it was uh, that's being caused by the gypsy moth or by something else? Yeah. Um, like, uh, yeah, you mean for the aerial surveys or right. just like in general or observations or? Or from your Landsat images as well. Like, okay, you can see these differences in the uh, amount of green, 
but how do you how do you tie that with one particular like causal? You have to match it up with a uh, sort of knowledge, basic ecology knowledge of what's going on. So like teasing apart, so winter moth and gypsy moth, both are heavy defoliators in eastern Massachusetts. Um, but winter moth does its defoliation earlier. Um, so winter moth starts feeding right at bud burst. Um, so the caterpillars bore into the buds and start feeding. So even by the time the buds unfurl, you have all these holes all through it of the caterpillars because they've already eaten there and they, they continue to eat but sort of by the time the leaves are fully out, winter moth is pretty much done. Whereas gypsy moth is another few weeks after that. So you can go into the, like the Landsat data and look for early defoliation in areas that you know, I mean, you always want to be checking the sites and sort of ground truthing them. Like, oh yeah, we know winter moth is there and we know that winter moth feeds earlier. So then you can detect change in foliage then. Um, whereas, okay, if we're trying to pick up defoliation from gypsy moth, we need to do that a few weeks later. We also need to make sure that we're checking that gypsy moth is not actually there and it's not some other species. So you kind of have to put together all these different pieces um, to get the full picture of what's going on. Yeah, so do you want to add to that? I don't know if you have that uh, map. Now the map actually shows forest tent caterpillars. Foliation. At least 2018, I think. The last map, that last map we did, uh, that one? That's just 17, so it's missing it from 18. Well, uh, does that have forest tent in there? Maybe there's some of that in the far west. It forest tent categories. You have to go, it depends on the forest type as well. Yes. So yeah. in, the, in, the, in the northern hardwood forest, in the maple dominated forest, you get more forest tent. Right, another thing, like ground truthing at both for like actually knowing which species are there and also, I mean, overlaying information about what the, the forest type is and what different species would be in those different forest types. Yeah. Yeah, I'll let you pick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's too much. Yeah. I know there's amazing research out there about, um, so, so gypsy moths, moths love oak trees and mm -hmm. they and start munching on an oak tree, that oak trees down the line, like even several miles away from that oak tree that's been attacked, will raise the level of tannic acid in their leaves because tannins are like their defense mm -hmm. because it's kind of an unpalatable substance to the gypsy moth caterpillar. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, like, if that takes place, is it, is it actually effective against these kinds of defoliation episodes, or, or does it really not make a big difference that oak trees are trying really hard to communicate with each other through root systems and chemicals underground, but it's not really making a difference? So I'm going to just comment quickly, and then I'll pass it over to Joe, too. I, he uh, where has worked really closely with Val on gypsy moth stuff, and has been working on gypsy moth work since the 1980s, since the first outbreak here. Um, so I will pass it over. I would just, uh, I'm going to do a little shout out for uh, the book, The Lab, Lab Girl. So if people have, haven't have read that yet, I strongly recommend it. Um, she talks a lot about plant communication in that book. It's fascinating, um, both woven in her just story of being a, a young scientist kind of trying to make her way through uh, life. And then she weaves these really neat scientific stories about it just has a really cool section about plant communication, which made me think of that. But gypsy moth and uh, oak trees, do you want to comment on tannins, gypsy moth, well, oak tannins, trees? Uh, as you mentioned, are a defensive compound that oak trees produce. And indeed, there is, there is evidence that when you defoliate the tree, it produces more tannins. That, that does, gypsy, uh, winter moths do not like that. They get, that's one reason why they're such an early season defoliator. They get in and get out fast before the tannins build up. Gypsy moths have evolved with tannins for millennia, and they, 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 they are not bothered by tannins at all. In fact, some of the, the some research that suggests that tannins actually uh, prevent um, virus epidemics in the gypsy moth population. So the tannins actually benefit the gypsy moth <laughs> uh, by preventing the, the viral pathogen that would otherwise kill them. So that's controversial. It's not everyone believe that, but gypsy moths are not badly affected by the tannins. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Joe. That's yeah.
So it's mostly, uh, I'll start it off, and then if we want our Gypsy Moth experts to add in. No, I knew they were going to be here, and I knew when Val was not going to be here, I was like, oh good, it'll be fine, we'll get all of our Gypsy Moth information out. But, um, so it's, there's a fungus called Entomophaga, um, which is from Europe as well. It was, there was a lot of, uh, sorry, from <laughs> Japan as well. There was a lot of work uh, done by Anne Hayek on that. She's over in Cornell. Um, she was testing it as a potential biocontrol agent and then it showed up here. Um, so it kind of somehow ended up um, in the Northeast as well and started moving through the gypsy moth populations. And so this fungus was able to um, cause epizootics in gypsy moth and kill uh, a lot of the, uh, to kill the caterpillars. What's epizootics? Uh, so a like outbreak of disease. So the, uh, there's an outbreak of the caterpillars and then an outbreak of disease kind of following along with that and crashing the caterpillar population. Um, that has to be synced with wet spring temperatures though. Um, so gypsy moth does a daily trek up and down um, into the leaves. So it treks up to eat and then goes back down into the leaf litter uh, every day for its feeding habit. And it needs to have moisture in the ground for that fungus to really be able to take off and reproduce um, and infect the caterpillars. And so when you hit uh, a couple of rounds of dry springs, you're not getting that fungus to uh, propagate and kill the caterpillars. And then there's also, um, I, uh, there's also a whole suite of different um, parasites that are involved in this too. And um, we'll pass this over to you too eventually, but I'll start with it. That um, some of them, so there's a species called Comsolor um, that uses a bunch of other species as well, in particular um, native silk moths. Um, but as native silk moths, so this was introduced back before biocontrol was regulated. So this is a biocontrol gone wrong. That so this Comsolor was introduced um, it for my for a gypsy moth, um, and it was brought in like, oh, this, this is great, it kills gypsy moth, it kills some of our native species, that's great too, because they're also defoliating things, like no problem, you know, like this is two birds with one stone. But then kind of down the line, it's like, well, actually, we don't really want our native silk moths to be killed, like we, we need this biodiversity and these, I mean, these species for just the ecosystem and um, just these are very charismatic, beautiful species that we're losing due to this. But with less of other species that Compsolora can be using, um, it seems like populations of Compsolora, this parasitic fly is also down. Did I cover it, Jeff and Joe? Yeah, yeah the only yeah. thing, thing I can say is that um, the other advantage to the fungus now is that this fungus can actually, um, the gypsy moth fungus, can, can operate at extremely low densities of gypsy moth. So once the population collapsed in the late 80s, like uh, the fungus came in through 1989, after that we rarely saw it rebound because the, the, if you even just got some rainy years, at low density years, it would kill 50% of the population, even if there were only 10 trees per hectare or something. So it maintains those densities at really, really low level. And that's worked really well up until the droughts of, what, 2014, 15, 16 that we had in May and, May and June. And then that allowed gypsy moth to just take off, so. Right. Gypsy moth has a, an enormous fecundity. Each female lays 600 to 1,000 eggs. So mm -hmm. it has the potential to explode 
two orders of magnitude even in one year. So if you, if you knock the mortality down, it can explode on you, and that's just what happens in the past mm -hmm. couple of years. Right. So each progressive dry spring, you just get more uh, exponential growth of that. Yeah. Oh, or yeah, we I'm going to defer to you. Do, <laughs> you want to. We, we can do one more question. I'm not and watching we'll, time. So. We'll do our last little section, but we can take one more question for now. I just wanted to say the gypsy laws march west. Does that fungus go with them? But then when you get into those drier places, that means it's going to be a bigger problem. The gypsy fungus is now spreading into the Midwest. Yeah. yeah. But And the fungus is there too. I think the fungus doesn't do so well in the, in the Midwest and the, the mid Atlantic states because it's hotter in, the, in May and June. The fungus, like, like all fungi, it likes cool, moist conditions. So it's cooler here. So we haven't had a major outbreak of gypsy moth since 1981 because of the fungus. Right, so gypsy moth has already spread very far, but it's resurging in these areas. And But so has the fungus has kept up with it. It just doesn't work so well in those areas. I'll defer to you. Yeah. All right, yeah, so we're gonna keep going. You yeah. can definitely save your questions because we can all uh, continue this conversation afterwards. Uh, but we do wanna get to all of our content and then we can we can continue to, to chat afterwards. So yeah, and thank you guys so much for all your uh, additional input on these questions. It's been a nice conversation. Uh, all right, so our last little section uh, before we uh, conclude. Uh, so we wanted to kind of get into looking forward um, using what we know now, kind of, wh what does the future look like for invasive species and um, and non-natives, and how um, kind of how climate change is also going to be uh, becoming more and more of a part of this dynamic. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I guess the the biggest uh, most or most broad question is kind of how is how does climate impact this, and how do you expect uh, climate change to um, to affect these uh, dynamics. It definitely is gonna change these dynamics in probably ways that we can't really fully anticipate. Um, but some things that we can already see. Um, so um, Southern Pine Beetle, I think is a really good example of climate change of changing our forest pests. So Southern Pine Beetle is a native species um, that historically was um, had a more southerly range um, than it does now. So it would be sort of Texas, Florida, up sort of halfway up the eastern coast. Um, and it would have, a native species would have little pockets of outbreaks and problems. Um, and yeah, it would cause a lot of damage. But the interesting thing there is we're now seeing populations and outbreaks up where they have never been seen before as a problem. So. Um, outbreaks in New Jersey and uh, some out on Long Island and um, it's sort of becoming this pest that before would not be sort of in consideration for Massachusetts now like hmm we should uh, we should be paying attention to this whereas on the other hand it's no longer um, or at least there haven't been big problems with it down in Texas anymore so its range is shifting north and uh, really we're really clearly seeing that um, and then another sort of thing that uh, I think I've been thinking about is one of the things I was looking at with, with my winter moth research is winter moth is uh, coastally confined. It seems like it's regulated by these sort of mo more moderate temperatures along the coast, the ocean sort of holding temperatures a little bit more moderate in the winter. So if you see a map of winter moth, um, it's really pretty much right on the coast of Nova Scotia, down the coast of Maine, coast of New Hampshire, coastal Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Like it's right there um, where it has these sort of moderate winter temperatures. Whereas Bruce Spanworm, the native species, is, is inland all the way across uh, the country, the middle of the continent. And so one of the questions I had um, with starting my dissertation work is, so Bruce Spanworm, this native species, is not, doesn't have these big outbreaks, or when it does, they're really short and localized. Winter moth is just, has big, um, long-term, like constant outbreaks. If these two species hybridize, are we gonna end up with a more um, sort of robust species? Or as climate, warms are we going to end up with winter moth uh, being able to move further west and that's 
I didn't find anything uh, conclusive with the hybridization question, but the uh, climate change and moving west, that's still to be determined. Um, winter moth is not here as a pest species right now, but it might be someday. Yeah. Wow. So, so. You, you were able to look at hybrids um, do some research on them? I did, yeah, I did do some. So we knew um, from earlier research that winter moth and Bruce manworm could hybridize um, some genetics work. Um, so again, looking at DNA and mixing of the genetic population. Um, and for this question, yeah, I wanted to look at hybrid vigor. I wanted to see if they were more cold tolerant. Um, I, as I said, I didn't see any conclusive um, results there, but we did get some more data. So I was able to um, produce hybrid species and get those to live through um, almost a generation. It's really hard to rear um, winter moth indoors, which like a lot of invasive insects are so hard to rear in the lab. It's like amazing that they're even a pest, like even invasive, because they just die all the time. It's like when you're trying to keep them alive, they do not. Um, and we, we also found that it seems like Bruce Spanworm, like the hybrids um, tend to hybridize back to winter moth, so the hybrids don't tend to go back to Bruce Spanworm. So there's a little bit of a concern that um, the Bruce Spanworm genetics are kind of being washed out by the winter moth uh, genetics. Um, yeah, so I guess in the last five minutes before our last bit of questions, um, I wanted to go into what can we as the public do um, to be aware of, of these issues of damaging pests that uh, we need to be aware of or um, their consequences on our ecosystems. So I guess one um, question to start is, yeah, what, what can we do and what do you recommend people going out into the public, what, what can we do? So back to what we were saying, I think being curious is something we can definitely do. So, uh, you know, asking questions, being aware of what new invasive species are, um, being sort of um, curious about why we do things the way, like why do we stock with Chinese ringnet pheasants or whatever species said, whereas not using native species. Um, um, being careful to not track things around. Um, so when you're out boating, you know, there's often signs to remind you to clean off the bottom of your boat so that you're not moving aquatic um, plant species around. Um, I'm gonna pull up, so I'm working, oops, I'm working now on spotted lanternfly, this species. This is down in Pennsylvania. It's a relatively new, it's only been in the United States for about uh, five years now, uh, a little bit less. It's a plant hopper, so it uh, is this bug that goes in and sucks the juices out of different uh, species. It's a particular pest of grapes um, and hops, but it can use a whole array of different species. Um, but the reason I bring this up is so these areas in Pennsylvania um, are under quarantine. So you're not in these different areas. There's lots of regulations about what products are able to, what you're allowed to move around and how you're allowed to move them around. Um, so different like nursery products and uh, of wood products and firewood, you're not allowed to move around in these areas. Or if you need to, there's a really rigorous inspection process. So we are, so here's some pictures. This is what I was doing earlier this week. Um, I, we just got back late last night. So this was, this was us a couple days ago down in Pennsylvania. Um, these are, it's hard with this projector, but these are egg masses just coating uh, a tree of heaven, coating the bark of a tree of heaven. Um, we were chipping, we needed those egg masses for the research that we're doing. So we chipped those egg masses off. Um, I know I'm talking about saving trees. We were not worried about saving these trees because these itself are an invasive species. So this is Tree of Heaven or Atlantis, which, so we're kind of doing two things at once here. We're both <laughs> killing this, this species here, which is invasive in itself, and we're working on how to kill this invasive insect. Um, but I'm at this because we, so we had all these insects that we're collecting and we're collecting these in quarantine and trying to move them out of Pennsylvania. And so there's a very rigorous um, federal permits to do this. 
the state permits to do this, our protocols on how we pack things, so everything was triple packed. We did a lot of quadruple packing just just because. Um, and we, like our tarps, those are all now in a freezer um, to kill anything on them. All the insects that we brought back, so our lab that we're working in um, out on Cape Cod, we have a quarantine facility there. So this is this particular facility that we can do this research that has extra airlocks and regulations and protocols on how you make sure to not move these things around. Um, so as scientists, we're doing all these things, but these are also things that as a citizen one can do to just make sure that you know what a species, what like our new species. So this is one that can show up. A couple detections have been found in Massachusetts. So just if you see anything that looks like these, um, contacting cooperative extension, so the UMass cooperative extension, being like, hey, I saw this thing, um, there's a page you can report these to and submit photos. Um, so being aware of that and being aware of if you're down in Pennsylvania to sort of look through your clothes and your stuff and make sure you're not tracking these species around is something that's really helpful. They'll eventually, probably, I mean some of these species, like as we're trying really hard to contain it, um, but eradication is not looking um, particularly good for this species, but anything that we all can do to help um, slow down the spread of these different invasive species. Awesome, yeah, yeah. great. And we, I think we have some materials in the back too that mm -hmm. we can, everyone should definitely feel free to look at our displays. And I think there's a couple of like little cards that you can take that have some information on what you should do if you see an invasive insect mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. So with that, uh, we have, we're kind of out of time. I'll, I'll say we could take like one or two questions um, if they're burning, but otherwise we can all also stick around and I'll discuss at the end. Yes, please. Is there some place online that has a picture of, or a master list that say these are your invasive species with their life cycle picture somewhere? You know what? There's a lot of different lists. Um, I thought of sort of summarizing this, but Honestly, I would say if you type in like Massachusetts invasive species, you'll get the USDA APHIS list, you'll get the, um, the state list, you can sort of go through, there's a whole bunch of pretty much your first three lines if you do um, Massachusetts invasive species. I know it's kind of like dumb, I'm like just Google it. <laughs> but uh, it really is. They don't have all the pictures with the life cycles to look for and all that kind of Yeah, so I'm thinking. Because I'm happy to see what you love. Yeah, yeah. I, my, my neighbor in the 70s in the outback that everybody remembers from Tim Tim also gave me an idea was Gordon King, the chair, former chairman of the forestry school at UMass. Mm -hmm. Right? He paid the neighborhood kids, he gave us all BB guns and said, I'll give you a penny for a kill ditch moth caterpillar. Yeah. He went on the I mean, our, and all the students were like, hey, Rick, how'd you do? And I was like, I got 50. You know, yeah, so yeah. Like, right the whatever. 50 cents. Uh, yeah, right. You, know, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. you can do better than that. Yeah. yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, but that was a slow, that was like morning before lunch. You know, we were, we were, but the point, the point is, is I, I knew what they looked like. They yeah. They were easy to recognize. But, you know, so if there's a, I understand Google will help instantly. Yeah. But they're usually pretty dry. You know, it's like, uh, give me a picture of like, what does it look like when it's immature? What does it look like when it's, you know? So I'm thinking of like, so the the cooperative extension page, the UMass Amherst cooperative extension page has some nice visuals on there of different okay. species. Also the USDA APHIS page, if you go to that, it page, the first page that comes up does look dry. It's just like this really list, this really boring list. But the there's hyperlinks to everything that'll bring you yeah. to uh -huh. photos. Um, Nature Conservancy also has some really <laughs> nice visuals and um, fact sheets on stuff. Um, actually, uh, the Cooperative Extension also has really nice fact sheets. Yeah. Um, like the big one for me because it 
literally didn't understand it was the, the one that's telling the ash, the emerald ash bar. I'm yeah. like, well, I recognize the tiny emerald ash thing. Yeah. Like, what does it look like when it's not that? You know? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, we yeah we actually have a um, little preserved vial in the back there with the uh, larval stage of the emerald ash borer. Um, but uh, as far I don't actually know much about it, but I'm sure there are a lot of experts here that can tell you about it. But I think you don't see them because they are hiding under in the bark. The bark. They're under the, the bark. Yeah. So we so also have damage tricky. there. Yeah. That log that's standing up, and then there's a couple of pieces out in front of it mm -hmm. shows the the damage of the larvae. So the larvae is crawling around yeah, under fine. that bark there, um, just these like little white beetle grub mm -hmm. things um, that are like identification yeah. of them at that stage yeah. really yeah. needs genetic work. Yeah. It's kind of part of it. That, yeah. Right. But there are other features you can see that if you see a woodpeckering, um, yeah. uh, all over something, I mean, that's a good indication that there's emerald ash uh, and uh, emerald ash borer in the wood. Is there, is there a native woodpecker that goes after them? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Our native, so oh, really? yeah, oh. all of our native species go all at them. That was actually uh, Teresa's <laughs> master's work. <laughs> we have it like we have, yeah. So <laughs> Teresa worked on the role of native woodpeckers and their role as important predators for emerald ash borer. And I think it's safe to say that they are really, really important predators not enough to keep it from outbreaking you but need it's a really more good indicator for yeah for if you see woodpeckering damage it can often that's how they find most of the outbreaks in the state is okay. via woodpeckering. right so you go and you can see uh blonding like where the both woodpeckering and where there's sort of bark being um sort of scraped off and it's a lighter color um, so uh, Ryan, who's here somewhere, taught me how to uh, drive along the interstate and pick out as you're zooming along at 70 miles per hour, like, oh, EAB, EAB, EAB. You can just see the, the, you can sort of get used to what that looks like on the trees when you see the woodpeckering and that blonding of the, the bark. And then, um, Mm -hmm. around there. It does, a lot, it does architectural woodwork. Mm -hmm. And he's like, they have a service down there to mm -hmm. go after termites. Mm -hmm. You know, New Orleans, the Louisiana coast is just termite heaven, I guess. I don't know. But they have this guy who comes out with a, like a static electric wand and just comes down and charges for the, and you look in and you go, dang it, they are all dead. I wondered when I saw the ash borer come out of the tree in our house, mm -hmm. in our front yard, I was like, hmm. I was wondering if I could just run, like, run around on the tree, because I was like, get up here. <laughs> you know? We never did it because there's our big amount of money, but would that kill them? I have no idea. <laughs> that's, that's a fascinating idea that I think should be tested. I mean, maybe somebody somewhere knows, but I have no idea. That would be awesome. I mean, and it was impressive to see because, you know, I was standing, I'll always remember standing over my ankle in the swamp in Louisiana going, why am I doing this? You know, looking and sure enough, yeah. a slow pass, but, you know, a pass with a rod with a stack of electricity coming out the end. We, we, we kind of, you know, you didn't want to have it over your body. But right. <laughs> right, right. You need to do it safely. I think that should be tested. I have no idea. Well, that, uh, we're a little over time, so sorry for your uh, uh, bite <laughs> chopping at the bit, but thank you all so much for your great questions. Uh, this has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, and let's give our speaker, Hannah Brawley, a round of applause. <laughs>